Uh, okay, hi. I'm uh, Fernando, and uh, I worked in a few projects with uh, Dr. Tubbs, and the rest of the attendings is here. And I think one of my favorite ones uh, is this uh, potential mechanism of injury during cervical spine procedures. Uh, to figure out, uh, to see if we can help explain what uh, ha uh, happens to our patients and why they are developing postoperative C5 palsies. Uh, we have no disclosures to report. So just a brief background, uh, postoperative C5 nerve palsy is something that we all see in clinic uh, on our patients. It happens depending on what study you're reading and uh, what uh, is classified as a C5 palsy, if it's four out of five motor strength versus not anti-gravity uh, uh, motor strength, it occurs in about four to eight percent of our uh, postoperative uh, spine patients. Now, preoperative cervical spinal cord rotation and foraminal stenosis have been studied in the literature, whether we should be doing foraminotomies on every single case, whether we should be fusing patients, whether we need to be careful in terms of putting uh, overlordotic uh, grafts and if this could be causing distractions on the spinal cord that leads to C5 palsy. And we've also looked at changes in sagittal balance as uh, being implicated uh, with uh, very mixed results. We know that something that is very common that we uh, almost all of us do in the operating room, especially with patients with uh, short necks or big shoulders, is uh, we like to visualize our anatomy, especially our bony anatomy, to make sure that we have the best uh, screw placement uh, possible and also, very importantly, that we do the correct level uh, surgery. So uh, what we uh, wanted to figure out is if depressing the shoulder, which we often do by taping the patient throughout the entire length of the procedure during cervical spine surgery, might result in some kind of C5 nerve traction with result in C5 nerve palsy. So pretty much we wanted to see is what are we doing to our patients uh, when we are depressing their shoulders during the entirety of a, anywhere from a one hour to a three or four hour surgery. So these are just some of the, uh, the variables that have been looked at uh, beforehand with uh, very mixed results, whether if a patient's curvature angle changes with a curvature index or some form of spinal cord rotation in that MRI, can we correlate that with the uh, incidence of uh, C5 palsy? So uh, what Dr. Tubbs and I did is we, uh, we uh, obtained 10 adult human cadavers. We underwent dissection of the spinal cord, cervical dorsal ventral rootlets uh, uh, from the cervical levels all the way down to uh, T1. And we uh, performed various movements, uh, shoulder depression, elevation, neck flexion extension, uh, and uh, head rotation. And we uh, measured the effect of movements on the cervical nerve rootlets. And uh, we generated a video, which I'll be showing at my last slide. So here's what we found. Uh, we found that the greatest amount of displacement of nervous tissue was generated by, sh by actually depressing the shoulder, which is very similar to what we do when we are taping our patient's shoulders down. And this was primarily seen at the rootlet level. Now, the greatest average displacement was found at C5, uh, with a significantly increasing gradient with C7 and almost no motion at C8 or T1. And uh, as I'll show in the video, with maximal shoulder depression, uh, your C5, C7 rootlet tension uh, produces actually cord movement that goes through the uh, ipsilateral side of the uh, arm that is uh, being uh, pulled inferiorly, actually up to one centimeter from the midline. So let me just give you an example. So these are two different pictures. Uh, the one on the right, of course, is just a dissection of the brachial plexus. You can still see the spinal cord and the nerves actually uh, coming out there with their contributions to the respective muscles. On the image on the left, you can actually see the C5. This is actually your spinal cord. This is C5, 6, 7, 8. It's actually just as if you were being dissected with your arms stretched in the anatomical, uh, anatomical portion. So what I'm going to do here is show a video that simulates, uh, simulates actually what happens when you're pulling the arm down. So you can actually see Dr. Tubbs here is pulling the arm down. So look at that. So sometimes we're actually having doing this to our patients for two or three or even four hours while we're doing surgery, wow. right? It's almost the same thing as if I was to ask you to put your thumb in your eye and see how it felt like. Probably wouldn't bother you for 10 seconds or so, but after two or three hours, you could probably be blind, right? So it's a similar movement that we're seeing right now. Uh, do, do we know that this is actually what, uh, what, uh, what is causing C5 palsy? We don't, but I think it gives us a pretty good explanation of what we're doing when we are uh, moving or uh, what we are uh, depressing our patient's shoulders and perhaps we should use other techniques rather than taping them throughout the entire cases. Maybe tape them once we have the exposure, once we do the laminectomy and and perf before actually performing the laminectomy when that cord is going to relax and bounce back, undoing the tape because we don't need that anymore, or actually uh, us ourselves for only a minimal amount of time pulling the arms down during surgery only when we need to see them, or even tie something to the arms, uh, some kind of a wrist, uh, 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 some kind of wrist ties and then pull them down only when we need to, to actually prevent this uh, significant amount of, uh, amount of tension throughout that entire procedure. So is it, tension, is it tension worse on the ipsilateral side or contralateral side? Uh, on the ipsilateral side, it's worse. But there's still, but there's still uh, changes on the contralateral side. Yeah. 
so I'll quickly go through it because I have two short uh, presentations. Thank you, Christian, for sending the slides for the first one. Uh, the first. So the aim of the first study was to was to see if standalone uh, anterior cervical discectomy fusion case, cases decreased the incidence of dysphagia, and they compare favorably in terms of neck pain uh, to the anterior cervical plate and gait system. So we looked at a one-year data, included 211, uh, 377 patients, included 211 in the standalone group and 166 in the plate group. We looked at the preoperative neck pain scales using NRS, and uh, the outcomes were uh, seen uh, with term, in terms of complications, readmissions, the dysphagia disability index, and the NRS scores at one year and two years. So these are some of the uh, data that we got of importance. We, we saw that uh, more patients in the standalone group had previous cervical spine surgery as compared to the plate and uh, cage group, which was statistically significant. Again, we, we saw that the preoperative neck pain was comparable in both the groups, uh, both in standalone and the plate and the interbody group, which was uh, not significant. When we looked at the difference in the pain scores at one year and two years and, and compared them to the preoperative levels, we found that the difference was statistically significant. But to our surprise, the plate and the interbody cage group had much better pain scores at one and two years compared to the standalone group. The DDS scores post-op compared to the uh, were were not statistically significant between the two groups. Can you say that again? This DDI score. So the DDS scores, when we compared between uh, the what standalone, is, what is it? the dysphagia disability index score is essentially calculated uh, based on twenty-four questions, where the answers are none, somewhat, or uh, or. Uh, very severe, very severe problems, and then the then the then the values are calculated. Uh, the, these these were done over a uh, telephonic conversation at two years follow up. So the patients who had standalone uh, system done, and the patients who had plate and interbody uh, fusion done, the difference between the dysphagia disability scores were not significantly difference between these two groups. So when we look at the NRS scores and ran a linear regression analysis, we found that the difference between the two groups was statistically significant when we uh, controlled the length of surgery and sex as uh, the confounding factors. And, similar, and the dysphagia disability score and the chronic dysphagia, when we looked at the two years outcome between the two groups were not statistically significant uh, either at one year, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of both DDI and the chronic dysphagia. So the difference was not statistically significant between both the groups. So, so Trish, I can't see on that slide how many people had chronic dysphagia? What was the instance of chronic dysphagia? So uh, this was essentially calculated uh, with a statistical method where they looked at the upper level and the lower level, and they calculated if there was any, any difference between the whole group. But it's question simple. How many percentage of patients had dysphagia? And by the way, it's dysphagia, not dysphagia, so we have to be careful how we pronounce that. Dysphagia. Dysphagia. Yeah. No, so I'm talking about a patient about surgery. What are the chances of you developing chronic dysphagia? So around 20% of the patients did have chronic dysphagia in, 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 in some form or the other. Chronic meaning yes. permanent? Yes. At two 20%? years. 20%? At two years. So chronic dysphagia scores were comparable in both the groups, standalone and uh, the plate group. With, so it, there was no advantage of using a standalone device uh, in terms of uh, chronic dysphagia. But the patients with plate and interbody group had better pain at the, at the end of two years compared to the standalone device, which was to our surprise. And this could be because of uh, a more unstable construct using a standalone device as compared to the plate uh, plate and a cage device. But uh, this was subject to uh, another study where we looked at the patterns of failure. So the second part of the study was to look at the patterns of failure. It was a, a retrospective study where we looked at all the standalone devices and saw if uh, how, how many of them failed and, in, and what was the pattern of failure. 
it was a retrospective review one and two levels uh, were included uh, we looked at the demographics the comorbidity scores primary diagnosis and surgical characteristics so these were some of the baseline characteristics which were actually uh, from the previous study uh, as a subset the implant failure uh, or the uh, the failure was seen in 10 patients out of 211 patients of so 4.7% readmissions were 11 which were mainly related to uh, dysphagia to four patients as CSF leak. This was, uh, so this table essentially shows the pattern of failure and what sort of surgical approach was adopted uh, for revising them. In brief, the average age was around 60 years, a single level was in uh, five patients and two level in five patients. Pseudoarthrosis was the most common pattern of failure seen in 70% of the cases. C5 body fracture was seen in one. Fusion and kyphosis was seen in one, and acute kyphotic, kyphotic collapse was seen in one patient. The average time to revision was 445 days, the shortest being two days, and the maximum being 1440 days. The two patients that had an acute revision had a C5 body fracture and acute kyphotic collapse, and they developed pain and neurological deficit had to be revised. The average time of revision for a pseudoarthrosis was 611 days. So just a few examples, uh, this patient had a C5, 6, C6, 7 uh, cord stenosis underwent a two-level standalone device platement. Uh, we, we can see on the right side, the intraoperative image looks good. At 18 months, they, we, the patient complained of significant increase in neck pain and persistent right side C6 radiculopathy. The CAT scan confirmed kyphotic collapse with pseudoarthrosis with, with compression of the C5, 6 foramen. This was revised by an anterior surgery where the implant was removed with a hemicorpectomy and an anterior cervical decompression infusion was performed. The patient uh, got better. Another patient with a C4-5 stenosis with a cord compression underwent a C C4-5 uh, standalone device, developed severe pain and neurological deficit. CAT scan was done, showed a hematoma. At surgery, there was a C5 uh, C5 body fracture which was uh, which was which was going through the screw hole site this was revised with a c5 corpectomy and an anterior cervical fusion and it was backed up by a posterior fusion uh, in, the, in the same setting so the surgical approach include anterior revision in four cases a combined anterior and posterior in two cases posterior fusion only in three cases and a posterior decompression in one case the patients who had anterior revision Three of them ended up having a corpectomy, two of them hemicorpectomy and one corpectomy. These three cases, all these three cases that had uh, hemicorpectomy or corpectomy had a blade mechanism of anchoring into the uh, vertebral body. And we, we, we suppose it's because of the windshield wiper effect that the blade actually cuts through the end plate and cuts through the body and uh, it's not a very, probably it's not a very stable construct. So in conclusion, 4.7% failure was seen in our retrospective uh, review. Pseudoarthrosis was the most common pattern. Standalone devices, especially those fixed with blades, may need uh, aggressive revision, probably a carpectomy. And posterior approach still holds a valuable uh, uh, surgical pattern. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our first experience in the US with a HAL trial. So I can never pronounce that. So we're just going to call this neurobionic rehab. Um, I have nothing to disclose so far. <laughs> and on the agenda, <laughs> we, um, we're going to talk about what is actually, what is an exoskeleton, and then what are the features and the characteristics of the RAL Hobart suit. And then I will show you some preliminary results of our first cohort here at SNI. And then if we have some time, I'll show you one case illustration. So I picked one out, which we can go in a little bit deeper. And then if we do have a little bit more time, I can also show you another case from Germany. So where am I from? And also one guest I would like to introduce in a second. Um, I'm from Bochum. It's the oldest trauma hospital in the world. And um, Bochum is here, just there. And this I would use, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Alina Ruhlmann. She's over there, and also here. 
She is um, the head PT of our Cyberdyne Care Center, Robotic Center in Bochum, Germany. And she's here for two weeks at the moment um, and training new PTs for the HAL FDA trial. So welcome, Alina, again. So what is an exoskeleton? I don't know, some of you might know that, some of you might not know that, so I want to give you a little overview. An exoskeleton is a machine which a person can wear, just as you can see here in the picture, and it increases the endurance and strength, and increases motion magnitude and dimension, and initially it was actually not developed for medical use, but rather for industry and military, as you can see there in the picture. So there are different systems out there, and I just want to like to talk briefly about two, um, so you can see the difference between these, the, these two exoskeletons and the ones we use here in, in Germany and now here at the SNI. So this is the exo. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, um, so it's an exoskeleton as well. However, it works very different from the hull. So basically. A walking cycle is initiated by the therapist, so for example Alina, pressing a button and then the patient walks. So there is no, so the, basically the exoskeleton moves the patient. And it can also be used like by weight shifting forward or backward, which is a posture control. Then we have the rewalk. It's also a passive system and the patient is basically moved by the exoskeleton as well. So what is important to know here, the patient is not an active neurocontrol. So, and that's the different to the system we're using in Germany and now here at SNI. Um, the Exos or the, the Cyberdyne company was initiated by Professor Sankai. Um, yeah, his company is called Cyberdyne and uh, he has developed several systems for arms, for legs and for the whole body version. And now here just brought you a couple of pictures so it doesn't get too boring, you can see something. So the HAL robot suit, how it works, I just want to give you a short overview on that. If we want to perform a motion, we start with a signal in the brain and the signal goes to the spinal cord. And then for example, in spinal cord injuries, patient who has an incomplete injury, a weak signal continues to the periphery and muscle and then the muscle can either contract or not. And this signal is then picked up by a sensor from a machine and put into the robot, and then the muscle is um, the muscle is supported by the motion of the robot. So the patient is in direct control of the machine. And what is unique about this, we have a neuromuscular feedback, and we believe that this supports muscle muscle hypertrophy and nerve uh, uh, nerve regeneration. So what are the medical indications? There are various medical indications, and we in Germany, we have primarily focused on spinal cord injury, and that is specific and great about here at SNI, because we are also looking, about, also looking at multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, and Parkinson's disease, for example. So what was our goal here at SNI? Um, we have extended the study basically to stable non-progressive spinal cord injuries to stroke, multiple sclerosis or severe movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. The goal was 30 patients over a two-year period. So far, we have completed three patients, and I think just last week before Nate left, we have completed the fourth patient, and three other patients are currently under the HAL treatment. So here are the results of the first cohort here at SNI. So far, we have three subjects. One, subject one was a 32-year-old female with a spinal cord infarct. Subject two was a 59-year-old male with multiple sclerosis. And subject three was a 53-year-old female with a meningioma and uh, a meningioma resection. So what you can basically see in the first graph is the total distance walked on the treadmill. And they all started very low. They couldn't hardly walk. And they slowly and significantly increased over the 30 visits they do here at the SNI, which is significant and really amazing because normally we wouldn't really think that they would be able to walk at all. And then the total time on the treadmill. So our goal is to let them walk for 30 minutes. So as you can see here, most of them, they started very low, 
but then they reached like the 30 minutes and most of them actually stayed up there, which is pretty cool. So then those are the outcomes. This is once the tuck test and the whiskey two score. I don't know if you know what that is, but the tuck test is the time up and go test. So basically you stand up, you walk for three meter, turn around and sit again. So this is basically um, the time in seconds they were moving. So subject three was pretty stable. Um, subject uh, through, no, subject, sorry. Uh, two was pretty stable, nothing much happened. In uh, subject three, she actually got way faster, significantly faster, and then at the six month follow up was a little bit slower again. And this is very interesting, that was um, subject number one, so you could think where's the first one. But at the beginning, she wasn't able to do that at all. So what's, that's why this data point is missing, um, which is pretty impressive. So, and then the whiskey 2 is the walking index for spinal cord injury, which can be also applied to all other um, uh, patients. And it, and it assesses the amount of physical assistance needed, as well as the devices required for walking um, following actually paralysis of SCI. And it's like rated from 0 to 20, and 0 patients is unable to stand um, or participate in assistant walking and twen at 20, it uh, the patient can ambulate with no device or assistance for 10 meters. So here we can also see all the patients have a very, very nice increase in the whiskey score, which is impressive. Then also in the first cohort, the six, meter, uh, six minute walk test. So we make them walk for six minutes and all the subject in significantly increased so they could they could walk way faster. And then the Berg test is the Berg balance scale. It was basically developed to measure balance among old, uh, older people with impaired in balance function by assessing the performance of functional tasks. It's like a questionnaire and what they have to do. The interpretation is like from 41 to 56, they have a low fall risk, then 21 to 40, they have a medium risk, and then zero to 20, they still have quite a high risk of falling. So subject one, he's still in that range that he actually has a high risk of falling, but the other ones all improved significantly. And then I just want to show you one case illustration. I want to pick one out to show you a little bit closer. And that was a 53-year-old female. She presented with numbness in the left body, especially left face. She had balance issues, no diplopia or headache. The outside MRI showed a large four centimeter a mass with significant midbrain and pons compression, which was then shown to be a meningioma. Um, she was referred to the Swedish Neuroscience Institute for urgent surgery on, um, let's always turn around, uh, 7th of March, 2016 and then had a craniotomy for a section of meningioma with uh, lumbar drain placement. So that was a post-op uh, MRI. And then she was severely gait attacked. She required wheeled walker or major assist from the husband. She was like hold off by the belt. And then she had a four to five, five motor strength in bilateral lower extremities. And the start of HAL therapy was October 25th. So we saw these results already earlier, but I've picked them out as well. This is the total distance walked on the treadmill and the total time. And what you can acknowledge here are these two dips. And that was quite interesting because our hull unit was for maintenance. And we had to send the hull unit back to Japan and they had to go into a smaller or a bigger one. And that just doesn't work. So we have to, we have to make sure that all the hull units are the same for the patient over the entire 60 days of treatment. So here we have the 10 meter walk test, the time, and the blue line is how much she walked before the treatment and red line is how much she walked after the treatment. So basically before, not how much, how, how fast she was, I'm sorry. So before the treatment, she was faster and after the treatment, she was a little bit slower. But it's, what it's quite interesting to see after the, to the end of the study, it basically levels off. So the time is pretty similar there. Also, what you have to acknowledge, what we actually haven't done really in Germany, I have looked at the assistance levels. 
And we also, we, sometimes we just forget this, but um, basically she started off um, as a moderate assist, and then at the end, she was not just a standby assist. So basically you just stand next to her and she walks completely on herself. And then here again, the whiskey score significantly improved and the Berg score also significantly improved. Um, six minute walk test also came much better and the tuck test, she was significantly faster to the end at the six months. Uh, at the follow-up, she was a little bit slower again. Okay, now I'm gonna have three videos you can see. So this was the walk performance with HAL. BVSTT means body weight support treadmill training at baseline. So you can she, she could hardly walk. And that was after 12 weeks of HAL training. The movement is way smoother. I think it's ways to see. And this was the performance for the 10 meter walk test at baseline. She almost, it's a little bit, I don't know, video quality is a little strange, but she almost trips with the, as I do here, strips, uh, strips once, tips over. And then this is after 12 weeks. The movement is very smooth. She's not, she has no assist anymore. It's just a standby assist. Ziadi is just walking behind her. She's completely walking on herself. And then the last video is the tuck test, time up and go test. So they have to get up, which is almost impossible for some of these patients to do that on their own. So basically Ziadi is really lifting her up on the waist belt. She can't do it on her own. And then really unstable, she trips again, almost as you can see, she, she can't walk on her own. And then this is the tuck test after 12 weeks. So she gets up completely out, on her own, out of the chair, which is really difficult for these patients. She starts walking on her own. No help, no support, just a standby exist. All right, I, so in conclusion here, um, we had a 12 weeks protocol and in terms of this patient, we had a significant improvement of speed, of distance and time of treadmill. I do have another case report from Germany. I don't know if we have enough time to, okay, then I just skip through this. Just one second. So there are some contraindications. Body weight over 100 kilo is sometimes a little bit difficult. Also, if the patient have contractures, we, we have problems with that. And then decubital ulcer and yeah, high-grade osteoporosis is also a factor which is sometimes difficult. Just to the last, the aim of this study, and this is what you have to understand, is the functional improvement um, with increased patient mobility without wearing the exoskeleton. So this is important to understand. We, want to, we don't want to let them walk in the exoskeleton for their entire life. We want that they have a significant improvement without wearing the exoskeleton. Okay, that's it. Thank you to the end, to my two mentors, Dr. Chapman and Professor Schildhauer in Germany.